So welcome to the rain out. barrel. <laughs> <laughs> You're all good? Yes, good to go. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. As you said, my name is Steve Yorjo. I'm the county agent uh, with Ocean and Atlantic counties um, and also department head for Ocean County, but also an associate professor with the agriculture and natural resources department at Rutgers. Um, I'm on the, the natural resources side rather than on the agricultural side. Um, my background is in water, uh, water quality and watershed management for 20 plus years, um, been involved in watershed management throughout um, most of the Northeast and the mid Atlantic area. Um, mainly I deal with water resource conservation and part of that is rainwater harvesting. So we're gonna talk to you tonight about rain barrels, et cetera. So, um, okay, there we go, the slides are working. Um, just this first slide, just to let you guys know that Rutgers provides um, equal opportunity for all of its programs. Um, and access for um, multiple people to be able to come to these programs um, as part of um, USDA and civil rights. Um, we just make people aware that we try our best and do our programs so that any, any, they're inclusive for all. So um, this is just saying if you have any concerns or feel that you know you are unable to you know participate fully in this, just let us know um as part of this so we just want to make you guys aware of that but we do our best to to be inclusive and to make sure that everybody can participate in our programs etc so thank you for joining us so tonight the reason you guys are here is to learn about rain barrels um, and the frequently asked questions that we generally get so we did this presentation in kind of a uh, different manner than we're used to usually we come up with a topic and we decide what we're going to talk about and then we talk to you guys about it uh, but for this, what we decided to do was we decided to ask you guys, what are your questions on rain barrels? So these are the frequently asked questions from um, our clientele. So we used our database of 2000 plus people that come to our programs that have signed up for our email list. And we asked you guys, what are your top three questions about rain barrels? And so we got your, your responses back and that's what I used as the basis for these, this presentation tonight. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the presentation and at the end, I'll open it up for questions. Hopefully I'll end early enough that there'll be time for additional questions just to hit some of the questions that I might not have gotten to um, because I do wanna warn you that I did receive from you guys over 190 questions. So don't fear this presentation is not 190 slides of me going through every single question we got. Um, but a lot of the questions that you guys had were related to one another. So I'm going to give you guys the frequently asked questions and put them in a larger context in terms of how to get rain barrels, how to winterize them, what to do about mosquitoes, all that kind of stuff. So like I said, this, pro this um, talk tonight is really based on your thoughts on rain barrels, or at least the people who participated in the survey and that we emailed. So I know that people are thinking about rain barrels, it's been uh, a few couple of weeks that we've had the past few weeks where we've had plenty of rain come through. Um, but before that, we hadn't seen rain for a couple of weeks. So I know people are working on either vegetable gardens or they're landscaping and they're worried about how much water to actually put down. So a rain barrel would be a great way to have that resource of water available at a, at a given time rather than using the, the potable water supply. But I know that people have been thinking about it because I get a lot of emails about rain barrels, where to get them, are we doing a rain barrel workshop, how do you install them, et cetera. So this thought cloud of, from the thinker um, is actually a word cloud created by all the questions that we received and the size of the word is related to how many people ask that question. So you can see some big words up there in terms of rain barrel, water. You can see the dreaded M word when we're talking about rain barrels and that's mosquitoes, which I'll go into a little bit later on. But really this talk is in response to the questions that you guys had um, of, for rain barrels. So hopefully I'll hit the bigger kind of ones to get people um, uh, involved or interested in rain barrels. But this really is kind of like the ABCs of rain barrels. So we'll be hitting some basic things um, and hopefully it'll make sense the order I put them in and, and, and what you can do with it. But like I said, we will hopefully have time at the end to take some additional questions from you guys if you've got anything in particular that I don't happen to hit upon in moving forward. But if you think of a question during the talk, feel free to put it into the Q&A. Hopefully I'll hit that question by the end and, and, and answer it um, through the presentation. But if we don't get to it, we can kind of circle around back to it and go from there. So first and foremost, the big question we always get is usually, are you guys doing a rain barrel workshop? Where can I get a rain barrel? You know, can I buy one? Do I need to build one? That kind of stuff. So let's start off with getting a rain barrel and actually obtaining one and um, being able to be your, uh, an owner of a rain barrel. 
So there's two different paths you can go down. You can buy a rain barrel or you can build a rain barrel. They have their pros and cons for both. Um, and whatever one you decide is whatever effort you want to put into it, whatever um, money you want to put into it. Um, but really, if you're looking to buy a rain barrel as a whole complete item, just be aware that the cost of that is going to be a little bit more than if you actually build it yourself um, because they're um, going to be cheaper if you build it yourself because you're putting in that sweat equity into it. You're doing it DIY. So when you're looking at purchasing a rain barrel as an entire rain barrel, um, the averages I've seen have been about $125. Obviously, there's a wide range within that. You can pay a little bit less than that. You can pay significantly more, especially if you're going for a rain barrel that, say, is made out of an old wine cask or an old whiskey barrel, or if you're going for like a large wooden structure or a, a large um, uh, plastic structure, that will factor into the cost of it. Um, usually we recommend that you have some sort of um, plastic um, because that will help reduce um, al algal growth and also um, other things um, being able to grow on the, the, the barrel itself. Um, but if you're interested in purchasing a rain barrel, as is the one on the left under buy is actually my personal rain barrel that I got through a watershed association. You can get them through a couple of different places. You can get them from big box hardware, hardware stores. You can get them from nursery and garden supply stores, and you can get them from not for profits or other agencies that are working in water. So, usually you can have a watershed association that sells rain barrels as part of a fundraiser. Um, you can have other environmental organizations that work within the field of water that are um, selling rain barrels as, you know, to, to raise funds, but also to promote the use of conserving water, et cetera. On the other hand, if you want to build it, you can buy kits. If you have the barrel yourself already in in in, in your possession, but but purchasing like the the netting for the, the the screen at the top or buying the the spigot that you need to install and all that kind of stuff, you can buy kits that come with that, and then you just attach it all to the barrel itself. And guess where you can get those kits? You can get those from the exact same places you can buy a complete barrel from. So you can do a big box store, you can do a hardware store. Uh, nursery garden supply stores and then not for profits working in water, which will actually have um, usually the entire uh, barrel and the kit to put it together. That you attend a workshop and then they will go ahead and walk you through the steps to build it and put it together, et cetera. Um, the average cost of these I found has been about $50, but that's another range. So you, some places, you know, especially if you're working uh, good to an environmental organization, some of them will give them away for free or just a nominal fee. Um, say $10, $15, um, or you can go up to higher if you're going to buy a kit from a big box hardware store or nursery garden supply store. Um, I'm, I'm not going to make the decision for you <laughs> as to which path you should go down, but just bear in mind, you know, the amount of work that you want to put in this, you know, obviously building it yourself is going to entail a little bit more work. It's going to be a little bit easier to just buy it and attach it to the house um, and install it, and we'll go through installation a little bit. But just keep in mind, you know, the, 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 the level of readiness that you want, whether you want something that's kind of all complete and you purchase it or something that you're going to have to put a little bit of time in to go ahead and put together, et cetera. Bear in mind, too, that there are additional expenses. Um, I'm just talking about the rain barrel itself right here when I'm talking about the average cost. I'm not talking about the cost for the installation or any of the other um, items you need, say, like on the right hand side, like the cinder blocks that are underneath the rain barrel. So that's an additional cost that goes into it. Um, and obviously the tools needed to pull to, to build it yourself, et cetera, and install it are not included in this, but just on the rain barrel itself, those are kind of the costs that you want to keep in mind um, when you're looking at doing it yourself or buying it complete. One of the things I, I, I want to point out is if you're thinking about getting a rain barrel, there's three th key things you want to think about, and that's basically within the anatomy of the rain barrel. There's three things you need to keep in mind, and that's the inlet. That's where the water is going to go in. This is usually screened to help keep bugs and debris out of. So there's usually some screen that's on it, like a window screen. Um, and then you're gonna have an overflow and the overflow is basically, you know, up high on the barrel so that when it fills up, it's got a place to escape out too. So it doesn't go out that top portion where the inlet is. So it's an overflow where the water is gonna flow out of and usually you'll have a hose um, attach this or piping attached to this to actually lead it out away from where the rain barrel is to say a garden bed or something else. And then you have the spigot, which is the way that you get the water out of it. Um, and if you're building the, the rain barrel yourself, you want to make sure that the spigot's not too low and not too high. 
and obviously that you have a, a strong enough base for the rain barrel to be on so it's high enough for you to get the water out and stuff but i'll go into a little bit of that when i talk about the installation so just keep in mind these three pieces when you're thinking about getting a rain barrel and 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 whether or not you're going to build one or you're going to um, buy one complete so these are the pieces that are really crucial that you need to make sure that you have Obviously, the barrel itself is a very crucial piece of this puzzle too. So make sure that you have a good, strong barrel that you go ahead and, and utilize for this if you're gonna do it yourself. I mentioned this anatomy um, because one of the things you wanna think about when you're actually getting a rain barrel or you're, you're either purchasing or building a rain barrel yourself is think about where that overflow is going to be. Make sure you have it on the correct side. When you have the overflow, <laughs> you want to make sure that it's either pointed to the right or the left of the spigot. So let's go back to the anatomy so we can see what are the pieces I'm talking about, the inlet, the overflow, and the spigot. In this barrel here, this, the overflow is on the left, okay? So it's pointing towards the left, so that's where the water is going to go. On this one here, it's pointed to the right, and it's basically overflowing onto the house and possibly the foundation, which is a no-no. So you want to make sure that you think about the location of that overflow before you buy or build. The other thing you wanna think about before you buy or build is, are you going to use the water in a rain barrel? And the reason I stress that is because when you have a rain barrel, you're collecting rainwater, the rain barrel is nice and full, but it's just rained. So you really don't have to water your plants right at that moment, but you do have a nice full rain barrel just in case. So if you have plenty of landscaping or a vegetable garden that you want to use a rain barrel on, then you have the ability to use that water, which is crucial to owning a rain barrel. So make sure that you have the usage of that water before you even start to think about buying or building it. So just think about the usage of the water and being able to utilize that water will help with issues like mosquitoes and algae and all that kind of stuff. But when you're purchasing or building a rain barrel, make sure you know what side that overflows on so it doesn't get you into a situation like this where you're basically not watering your lawn, but you're watering your house and the foundation in your basement, and that's a no-no. So you want to be careful with that. So where can you get barrels from? I know in the past that these are some of the places that we've gotten barrels from. This is obviously if you're interested in building it yourself and you get the kit and you have the screen and the spigot and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to source a new barrel, you can do it from barrel and drum manufacturers. You can do things online. I know that eBay and Amazon do sell like unused new 55-gallon um, uh, blue barrels like you see in the photos here. Um, the internet can be your friend on this and finding it. You can also get uh, barrels from um, industries that, that utilize them in some way, shape, or form. Um, and But make sure that you're getting them from an industry that's either related to um, food or something that's going to have a non-toxic um, material within the barrel. Uh, some of the ones that we've gotten them from in the past have been pickling companies. We used to get barrels from um, a company that pickled hot peppers, and those barrels smelled amazing, but we did have to clean them out. Um, beverage companies, I know there used to be a place uh, that did Pepsi in Monmouth County that would have these barrels as well, so that's food grade. Um, but the other place to think about is car washes. Um, car washes have um, the wax and the soap um, that are contained within these barrels. So you basically, if you get the ones that have the soap in it, you can kind of just rinse it out because it is just a soap. It is kind of you know safer to use on your, your vegetable, vegetable garden or your landscaping as well. Um, if you do get a barrel from here, make sure, as I said before, that it doesn't have a toxic material in it. Um, and that if you get a used barrels, you should make sure that you wash them out with soap and make sure they're triple rinsed and that the rinse comes out clean and not soapy. So you can ensure that, you know, you're safely um, collecting water for a vegetable garden and for your landscaping plants as well. So these are just some resources for this first question, which is where can I get a rain barrel? Um, Rutgers Park Extension has uh, numerous fact sheets. Um, their rain barrel part one talks about how to build a rain barrel. Uh, their rain barrel fact sheet part three talks about building a rain barrel from a plastic trash can. Um, if you're gonna go down this route and use a trash can, make sure you, you get a trash can that's made of a hard and sturdy plastic, um, not something like, um, like a softer plastic Rubbermaid kind of container. You wanna make sure it's sturdy. Um, because water does weigh a lot and it will bulge out and it will cause the, the, the plastic to warp if it's not strong enough. Um, but there's also a video on YouTube um, put out by Rutgers, New Jersey uh, um, Agricultural Experiment Station 
uh, through carp extension on building a rain barrel. And it takes you step by step. And the video is only about 10 minutes long or so. Um, but it does walk you guys through the steps for doing all that stuff. But these, these fact sheets are also available too. Um, I have made available after this for the people who attend. Um, I'm going to send out a, a list of all these resources with the website link so you guys can have this later on. So don't worry about furiously writing this down right now. You will get this afterwards for attending this workshop tonight. So, so that's our first frequently asked question, which was, where can I get a rain barrel? The second frequently asked question that we get is, how do I install a rain barrel? So you've gone out and you've made the decision, I'm gonna build a rain barrel or I'm gonna buy one, but now I have it at home and I need to install it. And I will say that this is the biggest hurdle for people in terms of the use of a rain barrel. We've seen in some of the rain barrel workshops that I've done, that probably about 70% of the people who come to a workshop build a rain barrel and then never install it. You heard me right, about 70% of the people who come to our rain barrel workshops have take, uh, built a rain barrel but not installed it. And this is the one part that you have to do. This is the step you really have to do to be able to utilize the water and collect it and put it in your rain barrel. That's why I want to remind people again, make sure you have a use for this water before you go ahead and make the leap and get a rain barrel. Um, I have a small property. I'm in a townhouse development in Mercer County. Um, we actually utilize the, the, the water for all of our landscaping plants. So it actually helps us, especially when it's especially dry, to, to actually have those plants survive. Your landscape plants, you know, you put them in the ground, you pay a lot of money for them. You want to make sure that that investment stays. So make sure you have a water supply that you're not using um, potable drinking water. You're using the rain barrel water. And the rain barrel water is actually better for your plants, which I'll go into in a little bit. So how do you actually install a rain barrel? There's a few steps that go into installing a rain barrel. And I think this is why 70% of the people don't install it because it does get a little involved. But we also have a fact sheet on this, which I'll mention at the end of this uh, section. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna prepare the area underneath your downspout where you're gonna put the rain barrel. So usually rain barrels are installed at a gutter downspout. You wanna make sure that you're going to level the dirt under that downspout and you may need to add some sand, some gravel, something else underneath there to to make a solid base layer. Um, you don't want to put it on a, so, uh, a, a soil that's too um, soft, um, anything too peaty, lots of organic matter, because then when that gets wet, you know, if it overflows from the barrel, it can get kind of soft and it can kind of um, distort the ground and make it uneven so your rain barrel will actually start to tip in a little bit. So you want to make sure that you, you have the base be nice and level because once a rain barrel is full, especially a 55 gallon drum, you have over 400 pounds of water in there. And if it starts to tip over and it starts to roll, that can be a hazard, et cetera. So you wanna make sure that you have a solid base and that it's nice and level. The other thing you can do, as I just mentioned, water is heavy, 50 gallons weighs 400 pounds, a gallon of liquid weighs eight pounds. You can put down um, a layer of bricks or um, cinder blocks um, or pressure treated wood, you wanna make sure that you have a nice solid base for that um, barrel to be on. And this also helps give you a little bit of height and it adds a little bit of pressure to the water as it will come out. So obviously the higher up that you put a, a rain barrel, the more pressure you'll be able to get. Um, but you wanna make sure it's high enough that you can get either a, a hose securely attached to that spigot out front, or that you're able to get a watering can or a bucket underneath that spigot. So make sure you have enough height to be able to do that. Mine is just on a, a couple of cinder blocks. I'm able to get a watering can under the front of it, fill that up, water some of the plants and call it a day. Okay, do that a couple of times, it's all good. Um, but you wanna make sure that you have a solid base for that um, rain barrel to be on and make sure that that solid base is level too so you don't have that rain barrel tipping, et cetera. Obviously, this is all easy to do at the beginning because your rain barrel is empty and it should be lighter. It's very difficult to do once you get water in it. So make sure you do this um, on a nice clear day and you don't have water pouring into your rain barrel as you're trying to install it, et cetera. The second thing you're gonna do is you're gonna cut off the part of the downspout that is kind of um, uh, overlapping where the rain barrel is. And you wanna make sure that um, you have um, a, a connector piece, like on the left-hand side here, either that accordion-like um, plastic one that um, stretches, uh, expands, or contracts. And you also want to make sure that you have the proper um, downspout connect connectors and turns, like you see on the left, that kind of like 45-degree angle um, that's going to get attached to the downspout. So you want to make sure that you measure um, these pieces of equipment. And there is a fact sheet that goes through these steps step by step. So I'm just kind of like cursely, cur 
just kind of going over it very easily right now and very quickly, but you want to make sure that you follow the steps as you go through this. Um, as the rule with anything, if you're going to cut it, measure twice, cut once, it's a lot easier to do that. Um, but make sure you have all the pieces um, in place to actually install the rain barrel uh, with you uh, and the proper tools to be able to do this. Obviously, safety first when you're doing this kind of stuff. So make sure that you cut the, the, the downspout down um, to the proper height that you need to with the um, added uh, downspout connectors like you see on the left, and then you would cut it to the proper height on the right. I would say as a tip, after you cut the downspout part off, hold on to it just in case um, for winterizing the rain barrel. If you're going to take the rain barrel away, you can actually attach it back on uh, with um, downspout uh, gutter straps uh, and actually reconnect it so that it can actually in the winter time just go down the yard and then you can put the rain barrel up in the spring. So you might want to save that piece that you cut off in case you need it later on. So this third part. There's two options that you have, which is why this step is 3A. So what you're going to do is you're going to put the rain barrel back in place and you're going to re reattach the curved part, part of the downspout. So you can see that kind of curved part right here on the top of the rain barrel, I'll put the rain barrel in. It's been cut to the proper height. Water will now go into the rain barrel. But you have another option. And the other option is you can install a downspout diverter. You can do something as elaborate as the picture on the right which is lots of PVC and they've added it extra connections for the downspouts. Or you can do something on the left, which is basically just a diverter that splits the downspout into two and it has a little lever on it that you can switch from one side to the other. So when you attach a rain, rain barrel, say to the left side of the diverter in the photo on the left, you can switch it so that the water just goes into the rain barrel and not on the right hand side. In the winter time, you can switch that so the water goes down on the right and goes to the downspout and, and, and to your yard and doesn't go in the rain barrel, which you drained properly for the winter because you don't want it to freeze and, and rupture, et cetera. So you have the options here. You can either just go ahead, I mentioned previously, just stick the rain barrel underneath that curved piece after you cut the, the, the gutter, uh, the downspout, excuse me, or you can install a, a diverter as well. Um, whatever is easier for you guys, whatever you think is going to work for your situation, that's the choice you can go ahead and make um, for you, uh, whether or not to use a diverter or or just cut the, the downspout. I personally, I have never used a downspout diverter. I know other people have and they, they swear by them. Um, mine is just connected to the, the downspout and it goes into the rain barrel. So that's another option that you can do. Then what you want to do is you want to reattach the downspout strap so you can make sure that that's um, uh, locked into place against the house or in this case the deck that it's attached to. Um, so that's that strap that goes on the sides of the the, the downspout. You screw it into the the the, the balcony here um, or the deck here or the side of the house, etc. So you attach that so it's nice and sturdy. Next part you want to do is you want to attach a garden hose to the overflow. So remember that overflow. You want to attach a garden hose to it, leave the garden hose or another type of hose to where you want the water to kind of drain out to and overflow to. It could be another garden bed. It could be another air area of your yard. It could be, you know, next to your driveway, et cetera. So, so the overflow can actually drain away from uh, the house. Obviously, make sure that if you do something like this, that you have enough clearance for um, uh, your foundation or a basement. Um, make sure that the water is going to get away from the house and not go towards the house because obviously we, this is, the goal is to save water, not to cause flooding in people's basements or to ruin their foundations. And to know that's the basic steps for installing a rain, rain barrel in your house. Congratulations, you're done. Fireworks are going off. You have a rain barrel and you're good to go. Okay, you just got to hope for the next rainstorm to fill it up. And you'd be surprised how little of a rainstorm you need to fill up a 55 gallon rain barrel. So those are the basic steps to actually installing a rain barrel. There are other options that you have. Um, I told you, I just went through the steps to install a single rain barrel, but you can uh, put multiple rain barrels into um, off of one downspout. You can see here in the top photo in the, the middle, what they've done is they've actually just taken the overflow and connected it to the next rain barrels inlet. And they did that with the third one as well. And the overflow would go somewhere else from that third one. So now they've tripled their capacity by just having the overflow go from one to the next to the to the next. And as you can see, they've installed the rain barrels in kind of like steps or different levels so that the water will actually flow down to the one below it. So they put the bricks underneath it. The one on the, the far right just has one layer of bricks. 
so the water will actually flow down as it overflows. So that's a clever way of doing it. The blue barrels on the bottom left, they've actually connected them with PVC pipes, but they didn't do it through the top, they did it through the bottom of the rain barrels so that the first one all the way on the left will fill up, the water will go down to the bottom and it'll go, you know, just be distributed equally to the next four, fill up those four, they've, you know, quintupled, I think is the word, quintupled their capacity by having five rain, rain barrels connected. And then you can see on the bottom right, all they've done is just taken the two overflows connected them together and then have a second overflow on one of them so that the water can actually uh, drain out of there, but they've doubled their capacity by putting this connector. Obviously, you still wanna have an overflow, so you just don't have it like bubbling out of the top of the rain barrel. You want that overflow to drain the water away to another hose, to another area of your yard. But you're not just limited to doing one rain barrel per, per downspout. You can put multiple if you have that need for that much water, et cetera in your vegetable garden or in your yard. So you can use multiple rain barrels off of one source of water. So how do you install a rain barrel? Those, that question gets answered with these resources. We do have a fact sheet on the installation and use, and also another video from the NJEES Cooperative Extension at Rutgers and how to install a rain barrel. This one's about nine minutes or 10 minutes long as well, goes through those steps and how to uh, install a rain barrel. The fact sheet also includes a parts list so to help you, you know, know what you need to buy and what tools you need to actually install a rain barrel. So I would say I've given you guys kind of just a flavor of what you need to know to install a rain barrel, but these guys go into a lot of detail and give you the step-by-step -step that is really needed. So once again, these resources will be available to you guys after, after this talk. So now you have a rain barrel, you have it installed. You want to use the water. So what can you do with the water? And this is one of the ones that we get a lot of questions on is what can I actually do with the water once it actually gets filled up in the rain barrel? Well, there's a whole bunch of things you can do with it. The easiest thing to do is to water your landscaping plants. And rain barrels will benefit your plants, especially, especially if you have native plants. Okay, because native plants are adapted to local climate, climate conditions. They're used to the rainfall in this area. They're used to the soil moisture in this community. Uh, uh, area in this location. So there are really benefits if you have native plants and you're collecting uh, rainwater. Obviously, these are some native plants for, for South Jersey. I did include the prickly pear cactus. We do have a native cactus in Southern New Jersey, but other flowering plants and trees will really thrive and really like the rainwater that you're collecting and using on them. The rainwater has no additional salts or chemicals, and it does have a slightly acidic pH, which is good for a lot of the plants because they prefer, uh, in general, most landscaping plants pr prefer a slightly acidic pH in their soil. So using a slightly acidic pH in the water helps to uh, maintain that uh, pH balance so that the plants can thrive. Okay, but plants love rainwater. That's how they get watered naturally. You're just collecting it in a barrel and saving it for later to put on them. They will love it, especially if you have um, native plants. So using it on your landscape plants is great. Even if you don't have native landscape plants, you can use the water on that too. It's probably the best way you can use the water. You can have the water used um, for vegetable gardens, but there's some guidelines you should follow, and I'll go into those in a second. Um, but you can get the, the water tested if you would like. You have to go to a private um, testing company um, because there are a lot of things that can get um, incorporated into the water through, you know, running off the roof, through collecting particles in the air. Um, one of the big things that tends to get collected in, in these kind of systems is a lot of pathogens, a lot of um, bacteria, um, especially from fecal matter. Um, if, you know, there are animals, you know, defecating on like the roof that, you know, they're running by or that, you know, they just happen to have, you know, dirty feet, et cetera. So you got to watch out for that kind of stuff. That's probably the biggest thing um, in terms of the water, uh, the water quality, what's affecting it is those pathogens that are in it. You can do some, some higher level tests, but obviously the higher level tests and the more tests that you do, the more expensive it's gonna be. Um, so you just wanna be careful um, in using the water. If you take it from the rain barrel and put it directly on landscaping plants, you should have no problems. Shouldn't have to worry about getting it tested. Um, but if you have concerns, if you're gonna use it in a vegetable garden, you can go ahead and get it tested, but there's some other guidelines you can follow if you wanna use it for that kind of stuff. And some general guidelines, for using um, this water, and particularly a vegetable garden or um, uh, a garden where you're gonna like you know eat the produce from, um, you want to make sure that that the water is disinfected a little bit. So you can use um, household bleach. 
um, in the ratio of about an eighth of a teaspoon, which is about eight drops per gallon of water. So if you have a 55 gallon um, drum that's filled with water, you're going to need, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, um, eight drops times 55, 444. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if I did the math right in my head, but, you know, you're going to need about, you know, a, a little bit of, of, of bleach to actually, you know, help disinfect the, um, particularly the, the bacteria that I mentioned that are in there. So you're going to need, you know, about 440 uh, drops of water, um, you know, about, you know, six teaspoons, seven teaspoons um, of, of, of bleach to per, in that whole uh, full 55 gallon drum um, to help disinfect the water. Um, you also want to make sure that when you do the bleach, you want to stir it in and you want to wait at least 24 hours before you actually um, start to use the water. And this is particularly for vegetable gardens. Um, just one note is that, you know, this water is not for direct consumption. You are not to cook with it or to drink it directly. Um, and that household bleach is not labeled for use to treat water for drinking purposes. So this is not a disinfection, a disinfecting method to allow you to drink the water. This is just so you can put it on things like a vegetable garden, et cetera. And even if you do that disinfection, what you want to make sure you do is for a vegetable garden, try to avoid getting the water on the plant itself. You want to make sure that you primarily water the soil. And one of the best ways to do that is to use drip irrigation. So basically you just have a perforated hose or a perforated pipe. You attach that to the spigot of the rain barrel, you open up the spigot and the water goes through and it slowly drips out and soaks into the ground um, just surrounding where you put that that gar that hose. Um, <clears throat> and then where you put that irrigation method. So that's probably the best way to do it is to actually just water the soil and not the plant itself. And if you do um, do this method for vegetable gardens, you wanna make sure that you try and um, water as early in the morning as possible. Um, vegetable picking should be delayed after watering, um, and you should allow like the ultraviolet light just from the sunlight to help break down any bacteria that might be in it. So these are just ways to help, you know, maintain your safety and your health um, if you're going to use the, the rainwater in a vegetable garden. So you just want to be careful of that kind of stuff. So just, you know, follow these additional steps, um, but primarily, you know, do a little bit of disinfecting, make sure that the water goes directly in the soil and not in the plant itself. And, you know, obviously thoroughly wash everything before you consume it, you know, you know, inside the house, et cetera. So just follow these steps for safety uh, to ensure that, you know, you're using the water properly. So in addition to the um, watering of plants, either landscape or vegetable gardens, you can use it to, to wash off cars or muddy feet. So obviously you're not consuming it, you're not drinking it, but you can rinse off a car, rinse off muddy feet. Um, I did still have a rain barrel that was um, still open in the winter, I guess is the nice way to put it. I was still using it in the winter and I was able to just kind of rinse off my car of all the salt, you know, that, that accumulates on the ro road and gets um, caught up on your car. So it's a good way to kind of like use up some of the water in there as well. Obviously, you need a warm enough winter that you're able to do that. Um, you can use it in the toilet tanks when your well pump is not working. So if you lose power and the pump isn't working, and you can't flush a toilet. You can actually just take the water, put it into the the toilet tank flush it and then you know sh should still be able to do what you do with a toilet and we'll just leave it at that um you can also use it in bird baths um you might want to think about doing a little bit of the disinfection first um before you go ahead and put it in bird baths but it is something that you can add to bird baths as well if you have those on your property as well when you're using the water make sure you use the water um, as soon as you can within a week or two that'll help discourage algal growth that'll also help discourage mosquitoes and i'll go into mosquitoes in a couple of minutes um, but you want to try and use the water as much as you can before the next rainfall is expected um, or you can just connect the spigot to a hose and like i said before in terms of the drip irrigation here i have a cartoon of a hose with holes being poked in it you can kind of diy a drip irrigation line if you have an old garden hose you can drill holes into it or punch holes into it and just connect that to the front of the the rain barrel this turn onto the spigot open up the spigot and then just let that water naturally drip into the soil you could do that for your landscaping plants and not just your vegetable gardens as well so that's a nice way to do that um, kind of passively so you just kind of turn it on when you need to let the water go where it needs to and then just turn it off and you'll be fine you can also use that method to kind of um, with drip irrigation to kind of you can hide the, the the hose within your garden underneath some mulch around the trees uh, around the landscaping plants excuse me that you can actually just have them like wind all around and stay there and then all you just have to do is just open up the rain barrel 
and you'll be watering your plants with drip irrigation. Um, so it's a really efficient way to do that. As I mentioned before, this is the big do not when we're talking about rain barrel uh, water. Do not use the rain barrel water for cooking or drinking. Do not use the rain barrel water for cooking or drinking. I'm going to say it a third time. Do not use the rain barrel water for cooking or drinking. This is not potable water. Um, a lot of water quality studies have been done of rain barrel water or harvested rainwater. Um, it is very, very, very high in pathogens and bacteria, especially fecal coliform and E. coli, which can make you very, very sick, if not do worse. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not using this for cooking or drinking. This is basically outside the house and what you do with uh, what you do with it in terms of watering landscape, watering yard, watering plants, et cetera. Um, the other do not is not to collect rainwater. If you if you've used a moss killer on your roof, if you have a roof that is um, shady or uh, is in a moist um, north facing part of your house, if you have a lot of moss growing and you use moss killer on it, um, basically that will collect in the rain barrel and then you put it on your plants and you're basically using um, a weed killer on your plants. So you want to be careful uh, with that. So do not use um, collected rainwater if you've you if you used a moss killer on your roof or any other sort sort of herbicide on your roof because that'll get transferred to the plants um, that you use the rainwater on afterwards. So you obviously aren't doing this to kill your plants. You're doing this to ki keep your plants healthy. So make sure that you don't do that. So what can you do with the water? We also have some fact sheets on this that talk about testing and applying harvested rainwater to vegetable gardens. Um, the concepts of, that deal with water quali quality and water quantity and what to think about in terms of horticulture. So once again, these resources will be made available to you guys at the end uh, afterwards in a, in a, in a one page resource sheet where you'll be able to download these fact sheets and learn more about it. So we do have a lot of resources that are out there. I'm trying to hit the highlights of these frequently asked questions and what you guys need to do. So we have a rain barrel. We've gotten one, we've installed it. We know what to do with the water, but by far, I think the single most que asked question that we had in, in terms of the response from you guys is, what about mosquitoes? Um, how do you deter, deter mosquitoes from, from growing in a rain barrel? How do you, you know, deal with them, et cetera? So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you put as many barriers um, between the water and the outside as you can that'll help reduce the mosquitoes from breeding and you know thriving within your rain barrel. As we all know, mosquitoes love stagnant water and basically what we're doing is we're collecting water and holding it for a little while, especially if you have long stretches of no rain, longer period of time that the water will sit there. Usually within 72 hours, you can have mosquitoes start to lay eggs and grow. So you wanna make sure that you're using your water very, very, very quickly. But some steps you can take to help reduce mosquitoes and the chance of mosquitoes being um, bred within your rain barrel are, are the following. So I mentioned before that in the anatomy of a rain barrel that we have the inlet. Well, hopefully that inlet is screened. So screening is kind of your first defense. It'll help keep debris out of the rain barrel. It'll also prevent mosquitoes um, from getting into your rain barrel. The other thing you wanna keep in mind is that overflow hose you want to make sure that it's nice and long. The longer it is, the less likely a mosquito will be to fly up that hose, get into the rain barrel, and then um, breed within the water that's within it. The other thing you want to keep in mind is the overflow on the inside. You can cover that with screening as well to help reduce the chance of mosquitoes breeding in it. So these are just some steps you can take as kind of like the first line of defense to actually prevent mosquitoes from breeding within the rain barrel. So make sure that the top is screened. The other thing you can do and that we sometimes recommend is that you use a mosquito dunk. Um, a mosquito dunk is um, it's a bacteria. It's BTI is the abbreviation. Um, I'm going to butcher the name, so I'm not even going to try, um, but it is BTI. It's a natural product. Um, it is something that is found. Um, the BTI is a, a bacteria that's found in soil, so it is a natural deterrent for mosquitoes and it should actually um, work 100% effectively to, to, to get rid of mosquitoes. So it's a good thing to put in one of these dunks within the, the, the barrel after you install it, go ahead. So this is the additional step in installing a rain barrel if you wanna deter mosquitoes. The other thing you can do is if you, you're a little leery about using the mosquito dunks is to create a barrier on the top of the water surface. So you have the barrier of the screen 
preventing the mosquitoes from coming in. But then if you put a barrier on the surface of the water, it actually prevents the mosquitoes from depositing their eggs um, because you're increasing the surface tension of that water surface so they can't break through. And you can do that through use of either some sort of oil, usually vegetable oil, or some sort of liquid soap. So what you have to do is put in a layer of a few tablespoons of oil or soap to make a layer that's about an eighth of an inch thick. That's a little too thick for the mosquitoes to, to, to deposit their eggs through. So obviously oil and soap float on top of the, the water surface. You make a little bit of a thin layer on top. The mosquitoes are unable to, to uh, deposit their eggs through that. And then you don't have to worry about, you know, mosquitoes getting in there. But as I mentioned at the beginning, mosquitoes really like stagnant water or water that's not moving. So the best defense you can have against mosquitoes in your rain barrel, and I will say that again, the best defense that you have for the rain for deterring mosquitoes from being in being in your rain barrel is to actually use the water in your rain barrel. By continually using it, you're moving the water a little bit, so it's not staying stagnant. It's not going to um, be a good breeding ground for mosquitoes. It's actually going to act, prevent the mosquitoes from um, breeding within that rain barrel. So the best thing you can do to prevent the rain barrels is, you know, put up these lines of defense, but it's also to regularly use the water that's in your rain barrel. By having it flow out a little bit, you're moving it a little bit, it actually increases the oxygen and that's really what, what deters the mosquitoes from, from surviving, especially when they're um, just hatched out of the eggs and living in the water and before they hatch out and are able to fly as adults. That's what you want to do. You want to use the rain barrel regularly. So as I said at the beginning, make sure that you have a use for the water that's in your rain barrels before you even get a rain barrel. Okay, so you want to make sure that you regularly use the water. That's your best defense and actually being able to prevent mosquitoes from being in your rain barrel. You can do those other things in terms of screening, which we recommend, obviously, both for debris and for mosquitoes. You can put a barrier, whether it's the oil or the soap, or you can put in the mosquito dunk, but regularly using the water will ensure that you don't have um, mosquitoes breeding within your rain barrel. So you, that's the biggest thing that you can do. And we have yet another fact sheet that is strictly just focused on rain barrels and mosquitoes, goes into their life cycle, goes into what you can do to help prevent them, et cetera. So this resource will be made available for you guys as well. So the last big question that we received for, for everybody in terms of these frequently asked questions for rain barrels is, how do I winterize a rain barrel? What do I do at the end of the season? So this past winter, we had a real winter. We had snowstorms. We had about four or five, depending on what part of the state that you're in, or you had fewer. But what do you do in the winter time when you you know you don't need the water to water your plants um, because they've all gone dormant? Um, the water would freeze inside of a rain barrel. So what do you do with about, about it, et cetera? It's really important that you do have a plan for winterizing your rain barrel because as we all hopefully know, when water freezes, it expands. You can't actually rupture a rain barrel if it if it has nowhere to go except through the plastic that makes it up. Um, I know people who've had old wine um, casks and uh, whiskey barrels as rain barrels that have forgotten to winterize them and the wood is actually splintered um, and those tend to be more expensive. So a little bit of money lost there. <clears throat> so obviously you wanna protect your investment of a rain barrel by making sure that you take care of it properly. And there's just a couple of steps you have to take to winterize a rain barrel. It's really kind of easy. The first one is to really just drain the water from the barrel and leave the spigot open. So it's still attached to the, the, the downspout. It's still next to the house. It's still on its base, whether it's bricks or concrete, um, cinder blocks or other uh, stable uh, uh, thing you put it on. Um, drain the water out of it. Obviously, so you don't get that expansion, you don't actually pop open your rain barrel or cause any damage, and you leave the spigot open. Obviously, you know, if you think about winterizing a house with winter pipes, if you have a crawl space, you make sure that, you know, that there's no way for the water to stay inside that pipe and burst, et cetera. It's the same kind of thing here. So you want to make sure that you drain the water from the barrel, leave that spigot open. Um, if you want to, you can remove the lid and anything else that's attached to the barrel, like the overflow hose, um, pumps, if you've attached a pump to it, which I'll get into in just a second. Um, take all that stuff off. And one of the other things you can do is um, at that point, uh, detach the rain barrel from the gutter or downspout, and you can replace that removed section of downspout. Remember I said during the installation to save that section of downspout 
you can use that to replace back on with a with a downspout strap so that it goes back into the ground or goes on a walkway or goes into a garden bed um, and won't go into the rain barrel and cause any problems, et cetera. So you can detach the rain barrel from that gutter or downspout and replace that removed section. And then you can take the, bar the barrel and you can store it someplace, preferably upside down. So obviously all the water drains out of it in a shed or a garage or in some other protected area that you have outside. I will say, if you do just step one, you've already done a lot more than most people do when they winterize <laughs> a rain barrel. So there have been some people, myself included, who've kind of forgotten to do these things and, you know, had rain barrels just covered in ice for a whole winter. And, you know, it can cause problems because that will back up into, you know, your gutter and you'll have ice problems and can ruin your gutter system as it starts to freeze, et cetera, and you have water freezing in it. You don't want to do that. So at a minimum, step one, of draining the water from the barrel and leaving the spigot open so that, you know, if it is warm enough and you have, you know, liquid precipitation in the wintertime as opposed to snow, if it rains, when it does actually freeze, it's got a way to get out because it will get out through the spigot and you'll just have a little bit of water in the bottom that will expand a little bit and you won't be bursting open your rain barrel at the seams. Um, so these are just kind of the basic steps in terms of winterizing a rain barrel. So you've gotten a rain barrel, you've installed it, you've decided what to do with the water, you figured out what you're going to do with mosquitoes, you're done doing all that stuff, you winterize it, and you've just gone through the entire life cycle of being an owner of a rain barrel. So congratulations. Um, we do have um, a fact sheet that I mentioned previously, the installation and use talks about winterizing a rain barrel and how what the steps are that you go about that. Once again, these resources will be available for you guys after this uh, tonight and once the video is available as well. Just some other tips for you guys. I mentioned at the beginning, you can increase your storage capacity by using rain barrels in series. And I showed you those pictures and I've got a couple more here about connecting more than one. If you have a high need or a high use for that water, feel free to put a couple together so that you can actually increase your capacity. Um, if you, even if you purchase a rain barrel, and, you know, it's easier to, to modify it if you do it yourself and build your own, but you can modify the installation to fit your needs. Um, for example, I mentioned pumps before. You can attach a pump to the barrel to increase the water pressure if you do want it to go through a hose, et cetera. I mentioned the drip irrigation before. I did not mention soaker hoses because the water pressure in a rain barrel isn't strong enough to get through a soaker hose. You're better off having a hose or a piece of pipe that has like full on holes drilled in it so the water can kind of drip out naturally. But a soaker hose just will, it, you need a certain pressure to get through that and to actually have the soaking happening. So you gotta be careful with that. But you can kind of get around that by attaching a pump to it. I personally haven't seen that done or done that myself, but it is a method to actually um, have the water come out a little bit better water pressure so you can water the areas further away from where the rain barrel is. And then you can also um, incorporate it into your landscape by painting it to a color that you want and landscaping around your rain barrel if you want to hide it a little bit. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see two painted examples. Um, I really like the pig watering can that's on the one that's in blue that's got starfish on it and other sea life in it um, and anchors. Um, this was somebody who went through one of our rain barrel programs and was so proud of how they painted it that they sent it to us. And I think it's just a great example. And then someone else actually painted it to look like a bumblebee. So they painted it black and yellow to look like a bee. However you want to incorporate it into your landscape and whatever colors you want to paint, whether to match the house and kind of blend in or to stand out like these examples, you can do that too. So these are just some of the frequently asked questions we get on rain barrels and hopefully I've answered some of the questions that you guys have, but I do think I have a couple of minutes. I do want to thank you for, for your attention and your time and really appreciate you guys being here tonight to learn about rain barrels. Um, but thank you all for being here and I really appreciate it. And if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to take them. All right, Steve, while we're waiting for, thank you. And while we're waiting for some uh, questions to pop up, there is one that um, uh, was a question, what can you do, um, what happens when there is that two to four inches of water at the bottom when you didn't have rain and it's still in the rain barrel? Um, I suggested tipping it, but I know sometimes depending on how that rain barrel is set up, it's not easy to tip um, to try and drain out that swampy water. Yeah, I, I, I have no, no particular tip. Um, this might be a case of do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> um, because my rain barrel has about four or five inches of, of water at the bottom of it. If I've utilized all the water 
um, especially in the winter when you winterize it, you know, usually do that hopefully in, in November ish. So you don't have to worry about mosquitoes because it's gotten too cold. So you don't have to worry about it that. But if you do utilize all the water and you have a little bit on the bottom and you don't have enough rain to kind of um, fill that back up and, you know, obviously the rainfall action, the additional water will stir it up and prevent mosquitoes as well. What you can do if it's not too heavy is you can kind of tip it back and forth, just kind of rock it. Um, obviously, don't do this when it is full because then it's, you know, eight, 400 pounds and you don't want to <laughs> cause problems and obviously not don't want anybody to hurt themselves. But if you just have a couple of inches at the bottom and you're able to just kind of give it a shake, that's all the agitation you need to prevent a mosquito from breeding in there. It just needs a little bit of a shake every once in a while. Just think of like, you know, maybe once every other day or so until it gets full back fill, filled up. Um, but the other methods um, in terms of the screening, the, the dunks, the um, oil or soap, um, all that stuff will really kind of help. But the good thing is you've used all that water and that's the biggest thing you can do to prevent the mosquitoes from being in there. Um, every mm -hmm. other year or so, you might want to completely drain the rain barrel and just clean it out with a little bit of a light bleach solution. So about 3% bleach solution just to help reduce any um, I'll just use the word gunk <laughs> that may, may form on the inside of the rain barrel as well. So a rain barrel, like in the picture on this slide, is pretty wide open at the top, so it's easy enough to clean out if you have a long-handled brush to do that with. You might want to think about doing that like every other year or um, if you're not using it as much, maybe every year just because the water is sitting in that too. So you just want to clean it out every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, there is another, um, do you have any recommendations for the type of paint that can be used? to paint the plastic barrels do you have um, any? At, as long as it's a paint that's um useful on plastics if that's the type of rain barrel you have but i will say just follow smart painting practices um so make sure you prime it make sure you know you paint it with a proper paint the other thing i would recommend is that you seal it and make sure that you get it sealed um we did a project, this was when I was working up on campus and we had people paint the rain barrels. We brought them to the local vocational school that had an auto uh, program because they actually had like the sprayers for like a car that were able to cover a large area. So they were able to seal up the, the, the barrels for us. Um, but you wanna make sure that you have some sort of sealant or plastic sealant, spray sealant to ensure that you're doing it. Obviously, do it in a well ventilated area outside, you know, follow the proper precautions. But any um, plastic paint should work. Obviously, priming it's a good way to start and then going from there. And that's a lot easier to do, obviously, if you um, are building your own rain barrel to do that from scratch before you start putting all the hardware on and stuff. So that's a good way to But just make sure that you, you, you properly paint. It's got a lot of P's. Properly prime and paint and then seal it up as well. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Good answer. Uh, yeah, definitely seal it up because we've yeah. had a few that have uh, have faded uh, very quickly. Yeah, um, and don't it, use washable paints because then the rain comes and washes all the paint on. I learned that one the hard way. So yes, yes. Uh, so some of the times the children we used, yeah, yeah. that was interesting. Uh, <laughs> um, there's another question about how do you keep the grit from the roof shingles from getting into the barrel or clogging the screen on the inlet? Um, Anything. You can't, is <laughs> the, the short answer. Um, I, I have this problem myself. Um, I think one of the things you can do is um, if you know that some of the, the shingles will, will, will kind of, shingles will shed um, a little bit of that material, um, you got to make sure that you have a, a pretty small size hole on the screen to collect at the top. Um, it would, for example, in the, the picture that's still up here, this, rain, this screen is actually removable. So if it does start to build up with debris, um, you you can actually remove it and dump it out and replace it. You don't want to um, kind of brush things off the screen because then you can kind of take the debris can scrape the screen and actually rip it and tear it and then it defeats the purpose. But you just want to make sure that it, that you're able to remove the screen every once in a while to clean that stuff out. The barrel that I have that I purchased has a small screen that's maybe about about six or seven inches by about three or four inches. So it's kind of like a photograph size, small photograph size that just kind of unscrews. Um, uh, it's a wire mesh and then there's a screen underneath it. And that's what I need to clean out every once in a while. But I have actually cleaned out my rain barrel where I've had probably about a half inch of that grit on the bottom of the rain barrel just sitting there and stuff. And it, it's kind of one of the, uno it's one of the unavoidable things on a rain barrel. Just make sure that you clean up that screen. It's got a small enough mesh size to keep that stuff out. But any big de debris that you see, try and pick it off, but don't brush it because then you'll tear the screen and then you have to replace it, et cetera. 
Okay, and um, let me see if there was any. I don't know, Patty, did I miss any? Patty? I don't okay. think so. Thanks. Okay, the one question I do have for you, Steve, is yeah. the hardware specific, and I know that's probably in the um, fact sheets. Um, mm -hmm. Is do we. Um, uh, sorry, the cat decided to join. Um, do does it matter if you use the the brass fittings versus the plastic? Um, I saw some of your green barrels had the uh, PVC versus the brass. I didn't know if it mattered. No, it it, it doesn't really matter. Um, it does it does matter on cost. The PVC stuff is going to be a little bit cheaper than the brass stuff. It also will go to aesthetics. So if you if, if you would much rather have a nicer barrel, um, I purchased mine. Even though it's plastic, it looks like a wooden barrel. But I live in a, a in a townhouse development that has certain rules and an HOA. So I had to make sure I at least kind of blend it in with that the the house. So really, just think about the aesthetics of, of what you want to put in there and and what it would look like. If it's going to be on the back of a house or back of a barn or something, nobody's going to see it. You know, do do whatever you feel comfortable doing. Uh, it doesn't really matter what type of, of material you use. Obviously, cost is going to be a factor in that, but you can actually, you know, you know, customize it to what you need. And I was thinking you did mention about the pump that um, I don't know if you know you do have some of that muck at the bottom, like uh, uh, mm -hmm. the question that had come up about mm -hmm. you might be able to put a pump in there and 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 pump it out, um, like yeah. a pool pump too. If you just if that's something that's bothering, because it does get swampy. I get the algae gets in there, and what do you do? Well, other other than disconnecting it from everything and then washing it would be the. I know it's yeah. hard, but. Yeah, I've I've heard stories of people tricking out their their rain barrels with like pumps and with aerators and all these other things to help reduce that kind of stuff. And um, I mean, you know, more power to you if you have the time to be able to do that. But I personally have never done that, so it's very difficult to say. Okay, this is how you install a pump with it. Um, but I know people have used pond pumps um, in, in it to help get the water out. Um, which might be, you know, you can avoid having the spigot if you just have some sort of means of having the water come out through the, the overflow or some other means. But um, I know that if you do a good uh, search on YouTube for rain barrel installations with like pumps and stuff, that somebody has a video out there that they can sh walk you through the process. Mm -hmm. You know, I just thought about, I have a, a shop vac that is a wet vac. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you could suck out the water with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not the full 55 the gallons, but yeah. No, 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 <laughs> no just, a, about just that. a little. <laughs> the the grit yeah. on the bottom, yeah. No, but just a little bit at the bottom, I think. Yeah. Know, you know, if you have one, that probably would work. Mm -hmm. I think that would yeah, work. Yeah, that's the, that, the, if, if you know you have that type of, uh, of roofing material and you're going to get that kind of debris, you might want to think about cleaning out the rain barrel frequently. Um, at least once a year to ensure that it's going to happen. The good thing is, if you if you winterize it properly and just you know do more than just that first step, you will be taking it and flipping it upside down so you can get the grid out that way too. So uh, the winter's a good time to do that kind of stuff. What what I usually recommend for people is um, like in the photo on the rain barrel here, they have that kind of like collapsible um, accordion like uh, downspout. If you use that, you can keep it short on top of the rain barrel. And when you remove the rain barrel, you can extend it further back to where it was originally. So it's a good thing. So you don't have to keep like um, cutting off and replacing your downspout. You can just use that accordion thing and just like have it go down to where you need to drain to and stuff. So mm -hmm. obviously further away from your 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 foundation and a basement, et cetera. So you don't you know, drain uh, flooding out those areas. Yeah, I think that would also work uh, if you have to clean out your the bottom again. If you if you have an issue with that algae at the bottom, mm -hmm. that if you have one of those um, collapsible rain spouts, so to speak, that that yeah. you could move it if it's not attached yeah. to another one. Um, yeah. There was but, another. Oops, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that that disinfection that I mentioned before, in terms of adding a few drops of the the the, the bleach, that should help with the algae as well. It's not just for the um, the, the bacteria, but that should help with the algae as well. But you know, okay. obviously, the, the the best defense is to actually use your water. So I always tell people use the water in it. Yeah, it's just get, you get those two weeks without anything, and then what do you do when you have that little bit stuck in the bottom? But um, Leona had a question uh, again about what about using beneficial bacteria packs? Have you ever? Do you have any words on that? Uh, no, I haven't run into that myself in terms of, of, of as an additive for the 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 soil and stuff. Is it in the water or I to help reduce stuff? I, I I think it goes into the barrel. I don't know. I I haven't seen it myself mm -hmm. yet, so I never. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. 
Actually, I think she I, may have I'm, I'm going to I'm going to claim ignorance and say I would have to look into that simply okay. because I just haven't dealt with that before. So it just would be something that you would have to be wary of and obviously following instructions to ensure that you're you're using it properly. But I haven't personally uh, run across that. Yeah, she said it, uh, she does say it, it goes in the barrel. Um, okay. So, yeah, and then the last unless uh, there was 1 other, um, what do you set the barrel on that won't rot? It's just the. Uh, Cinder blocks, I'm assuming, you know, what, what you talked about. The yeah, it, 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 it all depends on, 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 I've seen people put them on like wooden platforms, obviously some sort of um, pressure treated lumber or something like cedar that's going to survive being outside and possibly getting a little wet. Um, you know, any sort of brick or, or cinder block is always good to put it on. Um, as long as you keep it level, um, those materials should last a very long time. Um, I actually have mine on Belgian blocks, which were very hard to get level because they're very uneven. So um, I would not recommend that because it's very <laughs> difficult to do. Um, but if you have something that you can get flat and then you have something relatively flat, like bricks or cinder block, that would be something that would be nice and sturdy that you could put underneath it. And there are a lot of um, pavers and, and, and concrete materials that are at um, different stores that are a little bit more decorative. So you don't have to go with something that's just like a straight up gray cinder block or just a straight up red brick. You can have something that's a little bit more decorative, especially on the outside edge where it'll be seen, et cetera. Okay. But something um, solid like that. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, no um, there were two li little, uh, one comment and then a second. Um, Ken asked, uh, he said, or mentioned that he's seen a battery operated hose attachments that you can get a timer to water your lawn at specific times. Would that be a good thing to attach to a barrel for a timed watering? Um, yeah, that, that, I, I know that you, you, here's the thing. If, if you get a rain barrel, you can trick it out as much as you want in terms of like <laughs> what you can add to it. I have seen that there are timers that, that will act as pumps to release water that's probably best with a drip irrigation system just so you can have it you know open up for a, an hour or half an hour just to let some of the water out um i would say that that's probably the best method especially if you have a vegetable garden and that's what you want to water is to use the drip irrigation method or have some sort of perforated hose that you're able to get it out but um i haven't seen the pump pump ones done but it might be a good idea if you think it might be something that would make it easier for you to use the water and obviously, if it's timed, it's going to use the water every so often. So you'll reduce the algae, you'll reduce the mosquitoes. If you think that's something that's going to allow you to actually have the rain barrel and use the water, I'm all for it. <laughs> so if as long as you're going to use the water, that's what that's what I'm really hoping for. Okay. Um, and then the last one, I think that's what I see is um, uh, the uh, woman that was Susan had asked about the shingles so, you know, with the grit, and um, she's saying it's actually the grit is actually getting caught in the diverter valve. Um, so how do you deal with that? But I think it's just the same thing as cleaning it out a bottle brush mm -hmm. yeah. for a diverter valve. I, I mean, I'm not sure if that's the diverter from the main drop or the one, you know, to yeah. empty the barrel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to be careful that the, 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 the grit doesn't interfere with the mex mechanism of the diverter. Um, so if you have like, you know, just the latch type that just switches from one side to the other, other you may get stuff that gets caught up in there. Um, from what I understand, those diverters are, are are relatively cheap. They're only about ten or fifteen dollars. So, if it gets to the point that the grit is causing problems and you need to replace it, it should be relatively easy to replace. But you want to make sure that you know you're you're just staying on top of it and ensuring that that stuff is getting cleaned out um, every once in a while. So just check it every once in a while, and make sure it's okay. Especially after like we've seen the past couple of weeks, very heavy rainstorms. Um, you want to make sure, especially rainstorms that have a lot of wind to it, because they can actually blow debris around into your gutter system and cause that stuff to go down. So, like stuff off of trees or branches, et cetera. So, you want to be careful with that. Um, that's, I think that seems to be all. I see a lot of thank yous. Um, just, you know, uh, good, great, great presentation. Just you kind of answered, seemed to answer quite a, quite a few questions that everybody had, mm -hmm. um, which was, yeah. which actually the purpose, obviously. Uh, so I want to I want to thank you, Steve, for uh, coming on and uh, spending time and letting us know some more thank about uh, rain barrels. And uh, I, I keep saying I've got two perfectly good spots to put rain barrels, and I just don't know if I'll use the water. <laughs> I don't but know the, if I'll remember to turn it on. The, 
but well, uh, well, that would be that would be my advice. Don't you know? Make sure you can use the water, and don't let your guilt of not having a rain barrel like guilt you into doing it if you're not going to use the water. You really have to be have a use for the water to ensure. Because, like I said, rain will come and it will fill up the rain barrel, and then you'll be like, "Now what do I do?" Because now what? <laughs> it's a, yeah. everything's been watered by the rain already. So yeah. make yeah. sure you have a use for the rain barrel if you really want one. All right. Well, um, thank you. Yeah, but that was, yeah, a couple great. of, yep. Someone so. said very educational, clear explanation, and I concur. Very <laughs> thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Yep. And so if anybody uh, wants to join us for a vegetable Q&A, uh, that's going to be uh, next Tuesday at 7. Um, and please just uh, fill if you have a chance to fill out the survey at the end. I'm pretty sure it should, as soon as I stop, um, it should show up and let us know um, what other questions or comments you have for us. And we want to thank you again for joining us on our adventure uh, in virtual presentations. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Thank Good night you. and thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Sue. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Sorry, now I got to hit all the right.